a few minutes on the subject that we have dealt with in the past and always found to be very interesting. And that's synchronicity. Uh, synchronicity is a, is a term that was uh, coined by Dr. Carl Jung, who was a noted psychoanalyst uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, oh, just I, I just put that in there to see if anybody was paying attention. <laughs> I know that. That's what. How's that? Um, anyhow, what it means is coincidence with a purpose. Something happens. And you know, you say, gee, that was really a coincidence. But then again, on the other hand, you say, you know, what is the result of what happened? Uh, it, it, you know, because synchronicity says that this coincidence actually could have occurred through the power of one or two sources, either what we call God or the universe or something intentional from the invisible or somebody. I, I wanted to look at that subject, synchronicity, given the most recent event in London, England, the explosions in the subway there, which are connected to uh, these terrorists or, or whatever. Now, synchronicity, as I said, is a word that was coined by Carl Jung. And what he said was coincidence is not necessarily by chance, but rather a purposeful event to bring attention to a situation that we may act upon in some way to correct the flow of events. Let me give you an, 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 an example. Uh, we had this little dog. Dog has since passed away. We had this little dog. And we were down south, and, and we were coming up. And uh, we bought uh, some chicken for the dogs. And they didn't want to eat it. And, and they were spitting it out. I said, good, you're crazy. This is good stuff. This is good chicken. You have to eat. So we kept forcing them in, so they ate. Well, they both got deadly sick, really extremely sick. And we, we had to rush one of them up to a special hospital. And we got both of them to the doctor, make a long story short. And the little brown dog that we were talking about, when they were checking the dog out, they found a cancerous tumor. Now, if we had not gotten that chicken and insisted that they eat it, we would have never found that out. And, and as it was, we got you know the cancer cleared up. The dog died of something else. Um, and so that is a coincidence in that you know something happened that brought our attention to a situation that we otherwise would not have been aware of, which had a very positive ending to it as far as that cancer is concerned. So the people who take part in a situation like that are not necessarily aware of the synchronous nature. I mean, you're not, when you're doing that, like when we were trying to get the dogs to eat this stuff, I mean, we, we had no idea, first of all, that the one dog had a cancerous tumor. We had no idea. Uh, we, we had no idea that uh, there was anything wrong with this stuff. I mean, you know, these things happen. and you don't look at the synchronous or the synchronicity until after it's over. You say, gee whiz, you know, it's a good thing that happened. Or, 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 or sometimes you say, I don't know what made me do that, but I'm glad, or whatever. But people, you know, it's like uh, William Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and, and, and all the people are players. And basically that's what it is. It seems like we all play out our parts, but we don't know that we're playing a part. And everything seems quite normal until the event has passed and one begins to study it. 
And, 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 you know, for the most part, people don't. They don't relate one event to another event and look there and see, was there some type of a force, an invisible higher force involved in causing this to happen? We, know, we never get there. So the coincidence that we call synchronicity, we're going to address as a result of one or of two causes. One is either, for lack of a better word, we call God is responsible for it. There is, you know, people will say, guardian angel did this. You know, we make up all kinds of terms. Spirit did this. Something invisible, some invisible power kind of set this up. Or the second part would be somebody did this for other reasons. Let me show you. Let me give an example of a synchronous event that happened in this London bombing. So we'll take a... Okay, this is the, the bus. You know the, the bus that uh, exploded or, or, or was bombed. Now I want to call your attention as you look at that picture to the small white truck parked next to the bus. The name on the side of that truck is King Star. K-I-N-G-S-T-A-R. Now, as you look at that, this is the day that not only was this bus demolished, but subway cars in, in London were also demolished and people were killed. Now, <laughs> the interesting synchronous part of this to me is when you look up that company, Kingstar, in London on the internet, this is what you get. Kingstar controlled demolitions. Controlled demolition service for Kingstar contracts in the United Kingdom. Here's a bus blown to smithereens and a truck sitting right next to it whose business is controlled demolitions. Yeah. See? Now, this news photo <laughs> that we looked at is a photo that, you know, goes round the world. But, you know, let's take a, let's do it, let's take a look at it again. There it is. Now, you could, you could have had a plumbing truck, a bakery truck, an oil truck, but no, this is a demolition truck. You see? Why? Why is the synchronicity here? What, what I would think is so interesting, maybe it's to alert us to curious factors connected to this event. We don't know. Nobody knows. There is such craziness going on nowadays. You know, I don't know if you've been following all the events with the, the president's aides and these reporters and who leaked whose name. And, and it's getting like the Clinton thing now. The more that this special investigator looks into it, the more people are involved and, in, you know, God knows where it's going. And, and all of these things are so strange when you start looking at all the details of them, uh, <laughs> this day in London, at the exact same time that the explosions occurred in the subway, the London civil defense government were down in the subway conducting um, exercises to um, do emergency work in the event there was explosions by terrorists. It's amazing. They said it was one chance out of since the billion, zillion, billion that it would have. The day that they're down there conducting exercises for terrorism in the subway, the doggone thing blows up. It's amazing. So, you know, you, all of these different things. Now, we've covered this before. And I'm referring, uh, referring to the synchronous event of 9-1-1, 9-11. 
On 9-11, the Twin Towers in New York were destroyed in what to appeared to be an anti-Jewish basis for an attack. And, and there's, a, there's synchronicity here of something that had happened long, long ago. Look at this. This is Clifford's Tower. You see the two towers here? This was a massacre at York in 1190. And, and on the site there's a, a description under the pictures that says, the site of Clifford's Tower of York's medieval castle still bears witness to the most horrifying event in the history of English Jewry. On the night of 16 March 1190, the feast of Shabbat Haggadah, the small Jewish community of York was gathered for, together for protection in the tower. Rather than perish at the hands of the violent mob outside, many of the Jews took their own lives, and then finally the tower was attacked and they were murdered. Understandingly, this appalling event has become the most notorious example of anti-Semitism in medieval England. Yet it is by no means an isolated incident, but rather the culmination of a tide of violent feeling which swept the country in the early part of 1190. The tower at York was attacked by anti-Jewish elements in 1190. Now at, a time, at the time of this event, the Jews there were observing the feast of Shabbat HaGabal. This commemorated God's instructions to sacrifice a sheep at the time of the Exodus Passover. It was considered a defiance of their enemy because the Egyptians worshipped the sheep god Amun, or Amen, whose symbol was the ram or the sheep. And that, that's why Jesus is called the sacrifice lamb. But anyway, the Jews, in killing the sheep, believed it was an act of defiance against the Egyptians. And, and you, you can see that uh, the actual religious wars uh, started back over 3,000 years ago. But this is a statement of a rabbi named Rabbi Buckwolf. Jewish traditions and customs are always replete with meaning. And the tradition of Shabbat Haggadah is no exception. The ancient theme of Shabbat Haggadah may teach contemporary Jews that despite the redemption which took place over 3,300 years ago, today's events require us to be firm and courageous just as our ancestors were in the days of yore, defiant of their masters. Affirming with God's help, he says, that they will master their fate and define their own purpose pre-assumed definitions or destinies. For contemporary Jews, it is a time to affirm both the power and the love of God. Bah, 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 bah. But here, here is the point of synchronicity. Watch this. Clifford's Tower, York, 1190. Twin Towers, New York, 9-11. That's synchronicity. Coincidence? But coincidence with a purpose. Did the people involved know? I don't know. But regardless, as you study the two pictures from 1190 and 2001, ask yourself, what has changed? The attack had as its base religion and hatred. What's changed? What has been learned? Absolutely nothing. If the lesson had been learned from this, these would still be standing. See? So there was, there's a lesson that we learned from this. That's synchronicity. Now, 
A few months after the 9-11 synchronous event, something else synchronous happened. We'll go to the next. This is flight 587. The National Transportation Safety Board dispatched a full go team on Monday, November the 12th, 2001. That's two months after 9-11. To the site, <laughs> isn't that nice, thank you. To the site of the crash that day of American Airlines Flight 587, which had just taken off from Kennedy International Airport in New York for the Dominican Republic, Flight 587. Now, this was just two months after 9-11. So let's take a look at the synchronicity of Flight 587, but connect it with 9-11, because you know, it's just a couple months after 9-11, it was very strange. And to this day, they don't know what caused that plane. Or they say they don't know what caused that plane. Let's read here from the rabbi. The most noteworthy kings were David, who made Jerusalem the capital of Israel, and his son Solomon, who built the first temple. In 587 BC, Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar's army captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 587. The year 587 marks a turning point in the history of the region. From this year onward, the region was ruled or controlled by a succession of superpower empires. So how important then is 587 for the Jews? And the plane, two months after 9-11, which we connected to 1190, goes down, flight 587. But there's more. Flight 587 was destined for a town called Santa Domingo. Santa Domingo is in the Dominican Republic. There is a river that runs right through the middle of Santa Domingo. And it is the Osama River. Osama River, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic rises in the Cordilla Central Bar, flows east and south to the Caribbean at Santo Domingo. Here is flight 587, the year of the destruction of the Jewish temple, the year when the Jews literally went into captivity, on its way to a place where the river that flows to the center of it is Osama. That's synchronicity. You see? So you really connect the two because you've connected uh, basically an anti-Jewish attack in 1190 with that which had its basis as an anti-Jewish attack in 9-11 by the people from uh, Saudi Arabia. And then two months later, you have 587 and Osama. And the plane goes down. So now we come to London. Interesting. London. Let's show you that. The date of the destruction in London is July 7th, 2005, which comes to 777. 7, 7, 7, 5, and 2 is 7. That's the way you do. See, somebody could know this. It doesn't necessarily mean that God did it, but somebody could know that. Now, we find the prominence of the number 777 in the mystical book of Judaism called Kabbalah. Kabbalah. In Kabbalah, 777 is the flaming sword. That's what it is. 777 is the flaming sword. 
it's quite interesting when we consider the attack on London on July 7th, 2005, 7, 7, 7. So let's look at the flaming sword in the Kabbalah. Now, the flaming sword is two things. Let me show you. This is it, the flaming sword. The flaming sword, which is also called the Sephiroth tree, is the tree of life. This is Kabbalah. This is the tree of life, the Sephiroth tree, and it's also the flaming sword. And I'll, I'll explain how it becomes the flaming sword. Let me show you from the Kabbalah about this. From its hilt in Kether, these are Kabbalah, Kabbalah terms, the flaming sword turns left and right. And you can, you know, upon the tree of life, tracing the subsequent emanations of each of the ten Sephiroth. The path linking Binah to Chesed, these are two apart, was assigned the letter Gimel, G-I-M-E-L, since it is the only path which crosses the hidden Sephiroth. I don't understand, but that's fine. The sum value of these Hebrew letters by rabbinical geometria is the tripart number 777. Hence the title of Alistair Crowley's Kabbalistic Masterwork 777 and other Kabbalistic writing. So because this most important part of this flaming sword, the tree of life, is 777. But we have a curious connection to terrorism or attacks of some kind now in 9-11, 587, and 777. And, 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 you know, once again, you say, did somebody know? Was this from God? Or was, is this a coincidence with a purpose? Was it done by somebody purposefully to take place on 777? Was the attack in New York done purposely on 911 to connect to 1190, the, the towers. Was 587 picked purposely because of the Jewish connection and Osama? This is what the commentator on Kabbalah says about 777. And so this simple Kabbalistic equation Yielding the powerful number 777 is perhaps the single greatest Kabbalistic proof of the vari uh, variety of our one, dare say, cipher. I don't know. It reveals something of a far higher order than most are capable of perceiving at this particular point in the new aeon or age. Surely, even the most skeptical reader must marvel at this reciprocity, which indelibly suggests the workings of a greater intelligence behind our English alphabet and the words and numbers of Liber Alvel Legis, which is Kabbalah. So 777 becomes an extremely important number in Judaism. Now, either God knew, I can't say, or was it somebody who knew of Kabbalah? I don't know. It, but, but these are coincidences. Each event it seems to have had uh, synchronicity. So was there an intent that this flaming sword would be thrust into London on July 7th, 2005, 777. Now, just one thought on this flaming sword and, and the tree of life, which we've shown you here. And once again, this is it. And these are all points of life and the, and the various aspects of the sifra, the tree of life, and the flaming sword. Now, you remember when we were talking about this, the flaming sword, the commentary that went with it talked of the flaming sword looking from left to right on the tree of life. You remember that. And you can see how it moves from left to right. The statement actually comes from or is the source of the Genesis reference to the flaming sword when the mythological Adam and Eve were sent out of the Garden of Eden. Let's look at the book of, uh, book of Genesis in the Bible. And in Genesis 3.24, so he drove out the man, 
And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So, if this was not a 777 synchronicity from a higher realm, then did the bombers select 777, July 7th, 2005, the flaming sword to say, we are driving you out from your attack on our holy place and we will protect it with a flaming sword. So, so you know, <laughs> what we have looked at and what we have seen in these three events, 9-11, Flight 587 and 777 in London. And we, believe me, it goes way over the head. I have written, in the, even to the FBI, about thoughts about this stuff. And you, know, you, never get a, you never get a reply because they can't even entertain anything like this. It doesn't, it doesn't figure. They know the way they want it to come out and, you know, so. But, Still, for anyone who is willing to, as Jesus said, who has ears to hear and eyes to see, you, you, have, to, you have to wonder deeply in your heart. Or, you know, it's, it's just all a big coincidence. But remember what Carl Jung said. No, nah, there's a purpose to the coincidence. You can take that. Now... Over the last two weeks, we've been considering the single eye, the pineal gland of the brain. And there was a period of time when we discussed the pineal as the pine cone. And I'll tell you, in our last time that we messaged, I, I realized that we kind of ran out of time. And I, and I know I get a lot of calls from people from TV. And we did miss the end of that. So I just want to briefly fill you in on that. When we talk about the single eye, or the pineal gland. The word pineal actually means pine cone. And it leads to some deep but natural elements. Let's look at uh, the definition of the word pineal. Uh, Latin pinea, pine cone, hence the pineal gland, which is cone shaped. Okay. Now, I hope we haven't, I think we do have enough time because I have some really interesting stuff that came out, is coming out of Russia uh, about this. Anyhow, let, uh, let me show you the, the thing that you missed uh, last week when we were looking at this, and that is the uh, uh, connection that the pineal or pine cone has with ancient mythology and religion, uh, even contemporary religion, and, and, and you, you have to think that uh, the connection that's there is not even relevant to people. But this here in Vatican Square in Rome is the largest uh, statue of a pine cone on the face of the earth. You know, what in the world does anybody ask, why do you have a pine cone statue? In the, because basically, this is the single eye that Jesus was talking about, that Buddha talked about, that Krishna talked about. It's the single eye in the middle of the forehead, the third eye. You know, it is, it is the gateway to God, but who knows? How many people that walk by that pine cone have even a clue? I'm sorry, Jay, stand by that thing, Martha, and I'll take your picture. <laughs> <laughs> Now let me show you how deep into the Vatican this pine cone goes. And we showed this last week. This is the Pope, and this is the Pope's staff, which, you know, he carries with him in all public appearances. Well, right in the center, in the middle of that staff, is a pine cone. Okay? And it, there is another natural element of the pine cone that goes hand in hand with the Eastern understanding of Kundalini. And the, pre uh, the premise of Kundalini is that the electrical energy rises up the spine to the pineal or to the pine cone, which causes the advent of new life. And that, that, that in the natural state, that's true. We even have it at the pine barren forest here where f fire is needed 
in order to heat the pine cone so it, you know, it springs open and, and releases its seeds to, to create new life. And I want to show you what I did last time, how prevalent it was in ancient religions. Look at the ancient god Osiris uh, symbol, and here you'll see with the birds, and here in the staff, the well, these aren't birds, they're snakes, I guess. But here at the top of the Osiris staff is the pine cone as well. And uh, next we'll look at the Assyrian winged god, Tammuz. And oh, this is really an ancient one, as you can see, you can hardly make it out. But you can see his arms, and look what he's holding in his hand is a pine cone. Okay? And now we're going to look at the g ancient god of wine, and revelry, whose name was Bacchus. And uh, we'll take a look at that here, and you'll see this in the statue of Bacchus. Here at the very top of his staff is a pine cone. Okay? So you see that the pine cone, which turns out actually to be the pineal gland of the brain or the single eye, which is connected to epiphany and the, and the hallucinogenic ayasuka, has a connection that goes back to the most ancient of times. And in religion and religious symbols, still has the connection today. Although its followers have no idea what it means. Let me show you uh, one more, which is the Greek god Dionysius, who is the god of wine. And, and, and you can see with his staff, the pine cone. So, you know, whether the Pope has a pine cone in his staff, Bacchus has a pine cone in his staff, Dionysus has a pine cone in his staff, everybody's got a pine cone. Because of the importance of that symbol as to what it means. It's the pineal gland of the brain. And this was way before the word pineal even popped up as being that, uh, that organ in the brain. See, we'll look one more time here, and, and we'll see, uh, you know, once again, the... Uh, uh, the uh, pine cone at the Vatican, and, and this is located outside the Vatican in a, in a place known as the Court of the Pine Cone. That's the name of the court, the Court of the Pine Cone. Now, what I want to show you is a couple of paintings that were sent to me via the internet of Christian perspectives with the single eye or the pineal gland. Now, I don't know who painted these. I have no idea where they came from, except they are interesting, and they have a Christian basis. Let's look at the first one. Here you see Jesus, and look what happened. The single eye. And here the, uh, the message in Matthew 22, she says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And then here you have another one down here with two hands coming at it. Now, whether there's an eye peeking out of these holes, I, I have no idea. But, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on that, that single eye. And once again, who, who drew it or who painted it, I have no idea. Uh, there's one other one here, which is a picture which seems to be Jesus breaking bread. And here you'll see the eye again up in, in, in that uh, delta-shaped uh, pyramid or, or triangle, again, the single eye. So, you know, I think that in all of the information we've gathered about the pineal gland or single eye that connects with the emphasis put upon it by mystical writers and groups over thousands of years is the fact that it does manufacture a substance called, and I'm going to have trouble with this again, Dimethyltryptamine. Dimethyltryptamine. That's dimethyl, I always say. And dimethyltryptamine is a component of a hallucinogenic. I mean, you know, but everywhere you look, whether it be in Christian circles or in mythological circles, wherever, there's a look in the back of a dollar bill, it's there. Wherever you look, it's that single eye. And that single eye, we found here, has uh, as one of its components the fact that it manufactures a component of dimethyltryptamine, which is 
part and parcel of that hallucinogenic ayasuka which the shamans in the Amazon take, and that's for another story. A substance that we've shown from science that has taken people who have ingested it on trips beyond the realms of, of description. But why is it there? Why, why is this stuff secreted by the pineal? And, and why don't you take a trip? Well, you do when you dream, because it's responsible also for dreams. And when you dream, you do take a trip. But I mean, in the waking time, why don't? And I, I, we'll be able to answer that a little later. OK? But you know, you can't see these things showing up in all of these ancient writings and showing up in the Bible and showing up. And then you see the dot in the middle of the forehead, people walking down the street and so forth and so on, and not realize there's something far more than just a symbol. It's inside of your head. And it manufactures a substance. And the substance, when ingested, has the ability to take you out of body and into the universe and, and through the very doorway of, uh, of spirit land, or whatever you want to call it. So the combination of everything biblical, mythological, historical, and anatomical that has been written about the pineal or the single eye and the fact that it does manufacture this substance seems to bring together a way of understanding both the scientific and mystical applications of the strange single eye of the scriptures and the pineal gland of the brain. In line with this, I wanted to, to share with you a recent article that came out of Russia. Um, and it comes from the newspaper I'm sure you've heard of in Russia, Pravda. Let's take, let's take a look. This Pravda. May 30th, 2005, scientists discover third eye, the center of telepathy and clairvoyance. May 30th, Pravda. See? When you see what they are saying in this Russian document, then you should keep in mind all of our previous studies and the biblical statement of Jesus if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Oh, when you're praying and you're hoping that God will tell you something or something or the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, how is it going to happen? Telepathy is the only way it could happen. Because if the Spirit came through the ceiling, you'd run like hell out the back door and he wouldn't be able to tell you what is happening already. So you just have to telepathy. But let's look at uh, what this article says from Russia. Well-known Russian extrasensorial individuals, now their, their way of addressing things a little differently, have repeatedly demonstrated an unusual test. The author of the discovery, cyberneticist candidate of technical sciences and artificial intelligence, Vitaly Vitali Pravditsev said, the photograph, now get this, the photographic film placed in a light-proof envelope was put to the forehead, and the film started developing. Who, what do you, you can't say no. This isn't, a, these aren't crackpot people. This, he, Ted, they put it in, they put it on somebody's forehead, and the picture started to develop. The test revealed that certain people are capable of radiating so-called brain images somewhere from the forehead. Esoterics call this center the third eye, Mr. Providence said. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's terrific because you don't have to go down the street to have your film developed anymore. You just, uh, you know, you put it on your forehead. And, uh, but, but looking seriously, I mean, you know, this just sounds like a strange thing, but we've looked at a lot of strange things here from a lot of strange people. But these are scientists. And they do stuff, and yet they don't have to sell this to anybody. They don't have to get anybody to believe us. Who cares? Well, what goes on? I mean, you know, you talk about cloning and all. What's going on in some dark laboratory? So who knows? Now, here in this experiment in Russia, radiation power coming from the pineal 
developed images from the film. But now let's go on to the, to the next part of what he says. The fact of the third eye's existence can be found in modern embryology, too. This organ, as well as its photoreceptors, lens, and nerve cells, develops with a two-month-old human fetus. However, the eye disappears as the fetus continues growing. It leaves, what does it leave? The epiphysis which is, as you know, the Holy Day Epiphany. Mm -hmm. But don't tell them that, because they won't, they'll say, you must come here to Fork and River to learn stuff like that. It leaves the epiphysis, a pea-sized pineal gland, in front of the cerebellum. Specialists pay attention to the remarkable mobility of the epiphysis. And this is something I didn't know. That little pineal gland in your brain, its ability to turn like an eye. Furthermore, medics point out the direct similarity of the gland and the eyeball. It also has a lens and color receptors. Biologists, now here's the, here's the thing, hang on to this. Biologists say that the epiphysis has lessened in size during thousands of years of inaction, although it used to be the size of a large cherry. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm, all I'm here is telling you stuff that scientists say. These are some scientists in Russia. I don't know. But the point being, and that you could read this anywhere, so, that the pineal gland has atrophied because of lack of use. I say, well, why wouldn't people use it? Well, I mean, if you, if you go to any church, you'll have Jesus in the Bible say, if you're right, be single, your body will fill with light. That means Jesus is telling everybody, do this and you'll fill with enlightenment and, you know, stimulate the pineal gland of the brain. This is a, but if you go to any church up and down this highway and say, we should do that, they would say it's a cult. This is Eastern. This is against God. It's of the devil. So they don't. And they never have. Now, you say thousands of years of inaction. My goodness gracious, if you talked about this 2,000 years ago, they'd burn you as a witch. So nobody would talk about it. I get a couple thousand years of inaction. That would pretty much do it. Now, this is another interesting thing that this doctor in Russia said, which, which, I, which I found to be interesting uh, in the next overhead. He says, Indians, now I guess he's talking about India, not Indians as we know. <laughs> Indians still draw the third eye on the forehead, the center of invisible telepathic signals. The center of invisible telepathic signals. That's an interesting statement, you know. The forehead being the center of invisible telepathic signals. Signal. Now, you have to once again understand, though this come out in, in Pravda, you know, this is not something, you, you haven't seen this on television, or you know, this is, it's, it's part of a science page in Pravda that, uh, you know, and, and I would, I highly recommend, I, you know, people, you get so drummed on what you hear or what you understand is going on in the world, and uh, these papers are available in English to everybody, whether it be from France or, I mean, you really can understand what other people are doing and what other people are thinking about these questions, you know? So that, when they talk about the telepathic signals, that's what we've been suggesting in our watching meditation, where the energy of the signal is drawn to us by the actions of the electrons in the pineal gland. Now, you say, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you don't have to believe it because you can go to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and they'll show you, or I can show you, where they say when you stimulate an electron, you attract a photon. So if you stimulate an electron in the pineal gland, the atom, you will attract a photon, which is an angle of light or an angel of light. So then Jesus says in the Bible, you know, I stand at the door and knock, and if you'll open the door, I'll come in. So how do you open the door? You stimulate the pineal, and then the angle of light or the angel of light, the messenger, comes in, the photon. 
Now that's what that basically is saying. It's saying that communication with God or the higher mental realm, which we call God or spirit, is actually mental telepathy. Which, of course, it has to be. There's no other way. You know, I, I, I've never heard of anybody in any of these churches that say God spoke to me. That they, you know, anybody come in a room? It's mental. See? Now, probably the leading scientist in Russia, where I came to after I read some of this, on the pineal or single eye is one called, a fellow called Anatoly Radinov, and he's been scientifically working in this field for 40 years. And, and he makes a very, very interesting statement. And, and this is where he says, Anatoly Radinov says that almost all people can understand the third eye, mystery. For this purpose, it is important to develop the capability to perceive the most subtle bio bioenergetics process that cannot be seen with the normal eyesight, to learn to see what other people cannot see. Isn't that interesting? Because yes, there is life, there's things. I, I always use the example, here we sit in a room and there are television signals all over this place. There are football, baseball players hitting balls, there are horses running through here and all kinds of stuff. We can't see any of it. So we have to get something that can take us to the right frequency and then we can see it. Well, what he's saying is that there is an ability through the single eye of the pineal gland to be able one time to see what other people cannot see. I, I want to read you a statement well, it was too long to put on there, but I want to read you a statement from Anatoly, whatever, Rodnoff, that says, and he says this, our scientific, you can take that, our scientific searching in the sphere of a experimental biointroscopy has come into contact with the philosophic ideas of the university scientists with their views upon what we call the soul. He says, I think that works of Professor Ivan Borisov are very interesting. Being a student of the history department, blah, blah, blah. He studied philosophy and works by Hegel and Kant and other great thinkers. In his works, he says, Ivan Borisov reinterpreted the views of the thinkers from a man's sensuality and considered from a different point of view. I was impressed by French philosopher Paul Halbach about some fragile and invisible substance. The philosopher said, and listen to this one closely, the philosopher said that the thing called the soul is moving together with us now. Now centuries later, this sensational hypothesis was proved in practice. The experimental bioendoscopy has confirmed from a scientific point of view that the thing called the soul is moving together with us now. Moving together with the body and the soul. Now look, you know what he, he, he Albert does is, you know, know how he, what he calls the soul, how he defines it? An information clot of the biomagnetic field. An information clot of the biomagnetic field is registered by a specialist having the third eye open. He says, he says the third eye can be read even from a videotape living object. Which is, which, in other words, what he's saying is a person can watch a videotape of somebody and even read, and, uh, who, who has the third eye open, and read into that person. But, so it's very interesting where he defines the soul as an information clot of the biomagnetic field. Now, the complex of knowledge about diagnostic imaging is turned into a discipline of university education, which this guy says. And when I looked, I said, diagnostic imaging. Well, I've, I've heard about that. And it talks about med medical imaging by which physicians are able to evaluate uh, a part of the body that is not normally visible. Well, so I would assume x-ray, you know, and that kind of stuff would, uh, would be diagnostic imaging. But here, this Russian scientist is also talking about 
diagnostic imaging via the pineal gland with a single eye. I, I think it would be worthwhile in our study uh, to revisit the thoughts of uh, Rene Descartes on the subject. He was a 19th century scientist who discovered the optical laws of uh, refraction and, and reflection. But was prob probably, I think, and let's go back to the 1600s. He was the first person from a scientific standpoint to take a position on the matter of the pineal gland. And, and in 1649, he, he wrote a book called The Passions of the Soul. And, and, and what he did in that book is he split us up into two parts, body and soul. And that's what we, you know, we've been discussing that here for years. You know, the body is the car and the soul is actually, like the Russian scientist said, the clot of the biomagnetic field operating the body. That's what we really are, and I love that. An information clot in the biomagnetic field. Our personality, our memories, our thoughts, our dreams. When you, when you define that word biomagnetic, you see the confirmation of what we've been sharing with you over the years in uh, in describing each one of us as actually an electrical element, a type of photon that occupies a particular body for a particular amount of time. Let, let's look at that definition of bioelectromagnetism. Uh, Bioelectric, sometimes equated with bioelectricity, refers to the static voltage of biological cells and the currents that flow in living tissues. See how the Russian study is defining the soul as a clot in this field. In other words, an electrical particle of some kind is you and me. And that is the person that operates in this electrical field and operates our body, us. Biological cells use bioelectricity to store metabolic energy to do work or trigger internal change and to signal one another. That's, a, there's a, that's an answer to a long standing question. Are you ready for this one? Not only you are a soul inside the body operating it, but there are souls inside of each cell. Because if there weren't souls inside of each cell, how could they communicate? How could they signal one another? So when the whole thing is an intelligence of some kind. I mean, you know, uh, Albert can tell you, John can tell you, um, when, when you're, you know, you get into that situation where there's imminent danger, you go into that fight or flight syndrome where the body knows something's going to happen and you might get a cut or whatever, so it sets forth to, uh, to, for the clotting factor to accelerate in case you get cut. I mean, all of these things happen. Somebody knows this is an intelligence. So the intelligence is not only me, and the intelligence is not only you, but there are intelligence inside the very cells of this mechanism. Everything is intelligent. Everything is quote unquote God. Bioelectromagnetism down here is an aspect of all living things, including all plants and animals. And this is the one I like a lot. Bioelectromagnetism involves the interaction of ions. The interaction of ions. I've talked, like when we first started this stuff, about taking the rib from Adam and making Eve. Actually was saying, take an ion out of an atom and create a positive ion. Excuse me, start that again. Take an electron out of an atom and create a positive ion. Take that electron, put it in another atom, and create a negative ion. You've created positive, negative. You've created an ionic bond. You've created male and female, blah, blah, blah. And so what the Bible was saying was that taking a rib out of atom means that life began with the splitting of the atom. But see, that's what that says. The, the bioelectromagnetism, the interaction of ions. The ion goes from here to there and creates positive, negative Adam and Eve. 
And the last sound of bioelectromagnetism is sometimes difficult to understand because of the different types, such as brain waves and so forth and so on, lots of big words. The brain wave thing is obviously the measurable frequency of electrical activity that comes from the field and includes the soul or you. So with all of this, we, 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 and, and I know it can get a bit much, but you know, you can't go into a church or you can't just stay in there and say, oh God, come into me. I mean, you gotta know. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a road scholar to understand this stuff, to get a general idea. You don't have to know what an ion is. You just have to know that it's there. So Rene Descartes states in Passions of the Soul, he starts by splitting the individual, you and me, into two parts. Matter, the body, and soul, which we now understand to be this clot. Clot doesn't sound like a good one. This, this essence in the biomagnetic field somewhere. So let's see how Descartes separates the body from the soul. This guy was great. OK, well, how many minutes is that? OK. Descartes' criterion for determining whether a function belongs to the body or the soul was as follows. And I think it's pretty good. Anything we experience as being in us and which we see can also exist in wholly inanimate body. What, I think he means animate, but I don't know. Must be attributed only to our body. Okay? In other words, physically, the things you can feel, the things that hurt, the things that itch, whatever it is, you know, uh, it's us. On the other hand, anything in us which we cannot conceive in any way as capable of belonging to a body must be attributed to our soul. In other words, my dreams, my thoughts, my feelings, I mean, you know, stuff can't make that. Huh? So what he's saying is that anything such as a thought or a memory or a desire which we cannot conceive of as being part of a material thing must be part of the biomagnetic system or the electrical system, which in essence we are. So then he goes on. Thus, because we have no conception of the body as thinking in any way at all, we have reason to believe that every kind of thought present in us belongs to the soul. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, here I'm saying he's right, uh, you know, I'm, but I, I think he knew that in 1600. And since we do not 